what is Bitcoin? What is blockchain? What is cryptocurrency? These are the questions that I have all the time, uh, especially in my business, working with the Texas Blockchain Council. I get in these conversations with high level people and they give so much information but at the end of those conversations, I'm always like Zoolander, where he's like, but why male models? But why male models? You serious? I just, I just told you that a moment ago. So this series is gonna be breaking down blockchain for dummies, breaking down Bitcoin. And it's gonna be me, myself, Ryan Harper, with Michael Lewin. And Michael, lucky for us, he actually has a full course that he teaches at a local university here. And he's so graciously helped us, or agreed to help us and put it on film for the internet. So Michael, would love to hear what your background is real quick before we get into our first module of, you know, history of money and Bitcoin. Absolutely. So uh, my name is Michael Wallen and I do uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency consulting, uh, although currently I work at a security firm called Open Zeppelin. Uh, I've been in this industry since about 2012, so I've seen quite a bit, uh, had to learn quite a bit on my own, and then now uh, teach it to others, both uh, at a university lecture at UT Dallas and uh, in my spare time whenever I talk to people like you. Mm -hmm. So to break down what this is going to be and who it's for, it's for everyone. But if you're already an expert in the blockchain, we'd love for you to stick around. But this is more for the layman like me. So don't be annoyed when I ask stupid questions. Uh, it's probably because A, I don't fully understand it, or B, maybe it's not a stupid question. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, enjoy the module. Let's get into it. All right, let's get into it, Michael. All right. History of money and Bitcoin. So the first thing we're going to dive into is, of course, like, why is Bitcoin important? Why has it become so transformative? And really, you have to figure out what it's trying to replace, which is effectively money. So in order to dive into that, we're actually going to do a full history lesson. And this is something I love to do with my students is to really figure out, like, what is money to you? What is money to other people? And then how that definition changed over the years to the point that we feel like Bitcoin is necessary. And that's really, I think, the journey that people have to start on before they can even understand Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that, uh, pointed that out because like, uh, I got recommended to read or listen to the Bitcoin standard. You know, that, uh, the, yes. audio, the book, the audio yeah, book? great book. And, and, and I was told to get it because it's gonna be the history or it's gonna be the definition of blockchain and I'm still only halfway through it, but it's still the history of money and all that. And I'm like, yep. but, but where's the crypto aspect of it? So I'm glad you pointed that out, that before you can leap forward, you got to look at the past. Oh, yeah. So uh, before we start, we'll do a quick disclaimer. Uh, essentially, do your own research if you're going to do any investment. Uh, we are here to share a lot of information, but uh, we're not here to give you investment advice. Uh, definitely figure that out on your own. Um, I own Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, so I'm definitely somewhat biased, but... I uh, definitely believe it's a good space to be in. Just, yeah, do your own research. So we're not going to be like, YOLO, buy the... Nah, not <laughs> here. Not here. Good places for that on crypto Twitter, but not here. Okay. All right. So we'll get right into it. What What is money? How do we answer that question? Uh, well, we're first going to go with the really boring uh, single sentence definition, which is money is how we measure value. Um, there's many other different ways we can do it, but uh, when I want to put a value on this cup of coffee... Uh, it's either $5 or $10 if it's a really nice cup of coffee, potentially. Uh, and ultimately, from there, we continue to build up this de definition uh, of value. You know, how much is your time worth versus my time if we're being paid? Uh, how much does it take to live in a home for a certain amount of time? Uh, all these different things, ultimately, we have to as ascribe some value to so we can measure it. Like, this house is worth more than this house. And so it's kind of a unit of measurement when you think about it mm -hmm. that we use to figure out um, you know, what we want to pay for and how we want to use our time with, throughout our lives. And, and I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it basically came from olden times where it's like, I have a goat, you have a bale of hay, how do we actually make this transaction uh, equitable? Yep, exactly. So uh, from there, we can kind of like figure out four functions of money that like help us measure value. So the first one is a medium of exchange. So just what you described, how am I going to measure this bale of hay uh, against this like carton of milk that I want to uh, trade for you. Uh, so basically, instead of having to measure it in cartons of milk, say four cartons of milk for one piece of hay, we can use a piece of money 
uh, that can actually kind of like bridge the gap between them. So I don't need to use milk to, to pay you for hay. I can use the standard measurement and then use that to go buy milk. So medium of exchange. And then another one is a unit of account, a standard of relative worth in markets. So not only is that a good measurement for you between uh, us here now, but I can also potentially go somewhere else in another town and that's the same sort of measurement that I can use. So mm -hmm. it's something that's a language that we're all speaking. So like, because you have standard in quotations, because you always yes. hear the gold standard. Exactly. You know, or the fiat standard or whatever. So like, because I hear, I look at the sentence, a standard of relative worth in markets and mm -hmm. like my brain tells me exactly what it is, but just the wording of that, I'm like, but what is it? <laughs> yeah, this is a very academic uh, definition, but in reality, it's just, is this something that other people will commonly accept as uh, their standard for value? And, and you might have multiple standards. You might take, you know, pesos and dollars, for example. And, and typically, this is always in flux, right? Yes, always in flux. So standard is relative because ultimately standards are kind of up to people mm -hmm. to accept. But, you know, in the U.S., for example, the standard is set by the government and they say dollars is our standard. That's what you pay your taxes in. So... It depends on who you're talking to, but in a lot of cases, you know, the dollar, for example, is a pretty widespread standard to go mm -hmm. off of. And then after that, there's a standard of deferred payment. So not only, you know, the first two definitions apply to, like, us here now uh, or potentially somewhere else, but in the present, but, you know, how are we going to pay things in the future? If you're getting, you know, a salary and you expect to be paid that over the course of several years, um, you can kind of project that outwards. You know, you have that deferred payment for expected service or a debt. You know, you are paying a mortgage over 30 years. You know what you're going to owe over 30 years, not just now. Okay, so so the, the academic language of this is basically saying, and I know you just said this, so forgive me if, if I'm just Let's literally repeating exactly what you just said, but it's if, okay, you give me a goat, and I, I don't know why I keep bringing up goats, but like, and then, okay, I got to pay you back, but if it was in wheat, well, maybe in 20 years, I don't want wheat. Yeah. But now if I'm paying you a currency that we could both agree to, then that's something that you'll actually want in 20 years. Yeah, and this is, this is, is where, that, yeah, exactly. And, and okay. this is where money is really important because I don't want to have to worry about the fluctuation of the wheat market or the goat market. Right. I want something that I feel like I'll want in 20 years in, in an amount roughly that I think is fair now. So is this, and, and, I, and, and I don't want to get too off topic, but like when a currency collapses, is this why it's so devastating? Because you have so many debts that are, hey, I'm, I'm taking the, the German mark and all of a sudden the German mark is worthless. Well, then that debt is basically worthless now. Is exactly, that, okay. yeah. It, it destroys economies, not just because of the value that I hold in my savings account, but the value that's expected over the course of years. It's mm -hmm. totally thrown out of whack. Okay. So being, and trying to do business in a, an inflationary market is, is incredibly difficult because you have to try to predict inflation to say, well, uh, roughly 20% inflation, so you probably owe me this much over 10 years. So having some stability that's predictable in value over time is incredibly useful. I'll, I'll resist any kind of inflation jokes because <laughs> I don't. I we at the TBC, we're, we're try, Texas Blockchain Council. We're trying to stay, you know, I don't want to say politically neutral, but we're here for the advancement of blockchain within Texas. Yes. Not the advancement of Democrats, Republicans, Independents. We're just advancement of that. So everybody can have their political leanings, but there's a lot of inflation talk yeah. here in, in fall and, of 2021. And inflation applies no matter what political party you're in. Everyone's going to be affected. And right. so even right. e whether you think inflation is going to continue or not in the current times we live in, it's something that you should always you know, be concerned about and, and be aware of. So, yeah. And so the last one, of course, is store of value, which is just ties into the same thing. Mm -hmm. It maintains that value over time. So I know that when I'm, if I'm going to hold my value in this, in this form of money, uh, I know that I can use it in the next 20 years. It's not going to disappear over time. And, and granted, inflation is always potentially a factor, even in, in good monetary markets, or at least some fluctuation. But in general, I know it's not going to be worthless or worth significantly less over a period of time. So so for the layman, which is me, you know, the, you have these four things, the medium of exchange, unit of account, standard of deferred payment, and the store of, of uh, value. Yep. Most people... They don't. They're not thinking in ter the academia terms. They're thinking in terms of this dollar can buy that thing. Yep. So as as a layman, do do people need to know all that stuff, or is this just and I, back to the blockchain? Is it just important to realize those aspects as we move forward? I don't yeah. even know what I'm asking. I apologize. No, no. I think you're you're asking a good question, which is like when it comes to these definitions, how does that really apply to a? Day That's day? exactly what I'm trying yeah. to say. Is. Which I would say it's it's really. 
what is money to you? And I think in general, we instinctively reach towards these without even maybe understanding it. Um, but, but in general, I think everyone naturally resonates with money that meets these four categories as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Basically, can I go with this uh, dollar or this Bitcoin and go and purchase things in a way that I feel is frictionless and just feels like I can, you know, I can get my value for it and I can depend on it over time. Like that's, it's a dependable um, as something that people accept and hold its value. Excellent. So with that, we'll get into uh, some origins. So like you said, uh, goats where did and it wheat, come from? baby. Goats and wheat. Uh, barters and favors, trading before money. So mm -hmm. we can go back. We can find probably archaeological evidence. We can find uh, historical records of people in the beginning not using any form of money necessarily, but just saying, "Hey, I I do have this. You know, I I make really great milk. You make really great wheat." Um, we're really good at what we do. It doesn't make sense for me to try to also get into the wheat business or you to get in the milk business. Mm -hmm. Let's let's figure out a way to you know stay good at what we're doing but trade between each other because I still want uh, wheat and you still want milk. Right. So that's where barter and trading came from. And it used to be very close knit. It used to be you know small communities. Communities might not even necessarily barter at that time. They might say, hey, we live together, and anytime you need milk, just come on over. And anytime you need wheat, or, or you know, you right. get what I mean. We just kind of have a community that supports itself. But at some point. You know, you build, you start dealing with outsiders or larger communities, and then I start wanting to trade in kind at the time. Yeah, because you could also look at, like, if, if from a small village standpoint, you got the people that go out and hunt, you got the people that stay and cook, you have the people that make the, the tools and the weapons, and you have people that build the houses. And, you know, if all of them working together is what makes that society go forward. Yep. So very communal in the beginning. So there's yeah. really, there's kind of implicit bartering and trading, but it's really not with any specificity. There's kind of an expectation that, you know, we're, we're all going to be here for the long haul. Let's just help each other as much as we can. But eventually, you know, humans ventured forth from their small community. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, eventually humans being humans want to screw each other. Well, <laughs> well, once you get outside of the community, the people you have to live with the rest of your life, That's you're true. still dealing with outsiders that you know, you might never see again, then the idea of them potentially uh, fleecing you uh, right. is becoming a factor. So you're like, you know, I, I think I want my, uh, my wheat now, and then you can have your milk. And so you start having these kind of uh, at-the-moment exchanges. Right. Or, oh, I like, I want tomatoes. Well, tomatoes aren't in seasons. Well, tough. Yeah. So, again, you, if, you, if you have a thing that you normally pay, pay with, but it's not in season, then, then you're without a, a bartering source. Exactly, and that's actually a massive impact for, for most people, because most people had, uh, they had some sort of a, a farm that was producing some sort of crop, and that's how they, they traded. So they could only trade with goods really certain parts of the year, so they kind of had to just load up at the time and then go out to uh, either another village or some larger market, maybe even a, an early city, and that's where they could get their, uh, the goods that they would need to survive, the things they couldn't produce on their own. Mm -hmm. And so, from, and then you also have these markets that are very inefficient because, uh, like, how much is goat versus milk? Well, it really depends who you're talking to and where you're at. And so determining that barter price is very difficult. And so eventually we start moving into this uh, world where people realize, you know, I need something that's consistent across all these different products that I want. Right. Because cause I was just thinking, it's like, okay, well, if you move into the... As you progress forward in life and in just generations, you have new products, you have new inventions. And if everything is tied to a goat or a bale or hay, it's like, well, that new thing, well, how many goats is that? You know, but if you have money, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know what I'm saying. No, I'm no. A, hey, listen, people, I'm an idiot. So if I ever say go buy something, disclaimer, don't buy it. But also, you should probably sell that thing, <laughs> you know. No, it depends if the milk gone bad or not. But oh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's an area where like now you have to you're thinking too much to buy to get milk or get a product, and so how do you simplify it? Well, that's money. where money comes in. Got it. And so the early forms of money, you know, there was many things that people found. They found like shells, or they found uh, certain pieces of hay, or maybe they picked one piece of commodity. They said, you know, all of us want a piece of bread, so maybe we'll just measure this in loaves of bread. But then we realized, well, bread it doesn't stick around very long. Uh, it might go bad. you got to eat it quick. Um, and so they start looking for harder forms of money. What's a piece of money that I can hold on to for the long time? I don't have to think in timeline or I don't have to um, worry about trying to split it up easily. Um, you know, for example, cows maybe might be difficult. They uh, obviously die at some point, mm -hmm. and uh, it's pretty hard to cut a cow in half in a fair, potentially equitable way. Um, so that's where you start seeing commodity money, mm -hmm. or that really starts to hone in on 
gold and silver and other precious metals as well, even bronze and copper and anything you could use to make valuable materials with uh, became very valuable. But gold and silver ended up kind of being the winners over time because pretty much everyone wanted them. They were very rare uh, and you can make coins with them very so, easily. So from here and Gregory is like when it comes to the commodity style money, you wanted something that maybe wasn't so available that it would just, I, I don't want to go too far ahead, but like destroy the currency itself yes. to, 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 to uh, inflate, deflate, whatever. Uh, but also it can't be, it can't be so rare that it's not there, but it also can't be so available that everybody can use it. Exactly. And it also can't be a depreciating thing where it just like goes away, yep. like the bread. Yep. Usually, you're not going to find a lot of gold I have sitting no idea on the what surface. I just said. No, I, 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 you you <laughs> dived in on that. Where like, yeah, I basically I'm looking for something that strikes this balance of there's it's available to people, but it's not uh, so easy to produce that I can't count on it being valuable right. over time. Because and, and I don't know if it's in the slides because I did because I am listening at Bitcoin Center, so I don't want to be like, <laughs> oh, I'm smart. But it was talking about how like there was an island that used the shells the Pico shells or whatever shells for, as currency, and then a foreigner came in and realized, oh, their entire society is based off these shells. I can go get a, a, a whole boatload of them at this other island and bring them in and completely destroy the economy. Yep. I mean, they didn't do that on purpose, but they just like, I'll be the richest person in the yeah, world. It's arbitrage. Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's an opportunity to make money. And so gold and silver were always going to be rare pretty much wherever they were found. Like there's definitely some places that might have more mines than others. And that mm -hmm. actually became very uh, historically uh, a sign of, of competence. Like countries that did have gold and silver mines could be more powerful because they could finance, uh, finance themselves in ways that everyone else, you know, accepted that monetary good. Um, mm -hmm. But it was still something that overall everyone found valuable and everyone found sufficiently rare to trust. Excellent. And then at some point, um, even with gold and silver, you have to figure out, is this, pe is this piece of, you know, this nugget that I have, is this silver, you know, 90% pure, 99%? Is it, is it laced with something that just looks like right, silver? Yeah. And so that's where you had the Lydian coins where, um, you know, people, instead of having to measure every bit of gold and silver and test it for purity... Um, if a government uh, or the king, for example, came in and said, you know what, every bit of gold that I mine, I'm going to stamp my face on it, uh, and you know it's like 90% pure or, or whatever purity they're going for, uh, people can trust that. So it's not just now the gold content itself, but also the, the kind of mark that's put on it to say this is considered a certain level of quality. And, and I could assume that because the king or whoever put their stamp on it, there's probably severe consequences if you try to uh, uh, counterfeit that. Absolutely. Like death and execution and all those things. Oh, yeah. So that's where, you know, you do have a threat of force supporting this monetary system. And, you know, in the time it was important. You don't want people to, to undermine your economy. But at the same time, uh, yeah, it was basically this kind of cat and mouse game between people that were willing to, to either forge these coins or potentially, like, shave off lips of little bits of the existing mm -hmm. coins. Uh, in fact, they added uh, the Romans added ridged edges to the coins, the same thing we see on quarters today, because they didn't want people shaving off bits and pieces. Right, right. So this is kind of the battle back and forth for gold and silver money. It's interesting because, like, you know, if you look at the, the even our, our economy of the United States, how, like, it's in movies, it's in TV shows, anytime there's counterfeiting, it's like the, the full f might of the United States government is coming down on you. FBI, oh, yeah. Secret Service, everybody. Uh, just because, I, I guess, for your, the, what you're just talking about, how, because if you can have uh, currency or counterfeit currency, you could severely impact that economy. Yep, severely impact the economy and the tax revenue. Which is what they're really, is, well, that's the real thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's where it ultimately comes down to. Uh, with governments, they expect you to pay usually in the money that they're creating, and that's, you know, that's why they want to protect it. Beyond, you know, a genuine will to protect the rest of the economy, but definitely for them, there's a bottom line that is going to mm -hmm. provoke a reaction if you mess with it. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Um, so beyond this, like commodity money, we, we do see people carrying around this gold and silver coinage, but you, you eventually saw people doing really long treks where they might have to carry large bags of gold or silver if they're trying to make large purchases and potentially going as far as, you know, the Middle East or Europe all the way to China. And eventually, there was a recognition that, hey, you know, if I don't want to get robbed on the road because I'm carrying around gold and I can just take that gold and run off, uh, I would really love something that's easier to, to carry, easier to hide, 
uh, potentially something that has some security in it in the sense that you know someone couldn't steal it and then immediately use it elsewhere. Uh, and that's actually where paper money came in. I was going to say, like, like an IOU or something? Exactly. So really the first representative money, so paper receipts for commodity money, hmm. uh, were just merchants and banks that started issuing receipts for commodity money, saying, hey, if you're carrying gold from uh, you know, Timbuktu all the way to Beijing, uh, maybe there's a merchant that, that you know, does that route and has money on both sides of that. They'll give you an IOU, you carry it all the way to China, and you can cash it in. Uh, for commodity money at the time. So these, these kind of receipts that would make it much easier to carry money around. So the first real merchants and banking sectors were built up as just places to uh, essentially either borrow and lend or just you know count on money that uh, you're saving or storing in one place to be available in another place with a piece of paper. And what's funny is like, I'm thinking to myself, because again, I've been in this, I've been in crypto for like a month and a half, two months maybe. And I'm just thinking, I wonder what kind of gas fees they had on the on, on either end, because obviously they're going to take a cut on the front side, and they're yep. also going to take a cut on the back side. You know, I wonder what that cut would, was for that. Um, for that question, the ability to do that. Yeah, potentially charging on on the exchange, or or just you know saying, hey, we're sitting on a bunch of money, and people are going to be coming back for it at some point. Let's lend it out in the meantime, make a little extra dough, and then you know maybe we don't even have to charge interest. Uh, on the deposit holder, huh. but we get to make some money on the side by lending it out in the, while we're, you know, while they're, uh, before they come back for it, so right, to speak. Right, right, right. And so there's this game of balancing that, of course, that eventually leads to the modern day banking sector of just balancing the amount of money you're lending versus people uh, store with you for uh -huh. safety or, or convenience. Excellent. So, so really, the first representative money was not governments issuing them, but rather banks and merchants. Merchants. And only later did governments realize that they could do it themselves by, you know, creating a central depository of commodity money like gold and silver, and then lending it out uh, through their own form of. Paper. Well, they probably, again, I don't, I don't know the full history, but they probably saw the power these merchants started getting. Because, like, if you look at, like, any of the old uh, uh, pirate movies, like, <laughs> it's, it's the uh, uh, what was the uh, Br British naval merchant company? Oh, it, the East India Trading Company. Yeah, East India. Yes. It, it wasn't, it, they were like the most powerful army in the world. They issued their own money, yeah, yeah. easily. And they weren't the government, they were just, a, you know, a, a merchant. Anyone with the power to enforce their own monetary system can effectively issue money. Right. So it's it's this interesting game, and eventually governments monopolize that because they realize the, the power, power of it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it became a form of, uh, basically, yeah, this is a way for us to keep control the commodity money in the cycle and then issue representative money that can be used elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, some governments like uh, the Spanish Empire, for example, mined a lot of gold and silver in America, brought it over. They actually managed to still uh, spend it all, as mm. the government usually does. <laughs> um, or lose it in, yeah. the, in the Bahamas and the Caribbean and all that. Yep. Yeah. And, well, actually losing it to uh, the modern day or the uh, ancient pirates of the English. The English privateers, yeah. when at war, would take all this money that was just sitting on these big vulnerable boats and, uh, you know, basically take a pretty large cut of everything moving between the Americas. And so, uh, I don't know if there's a way to prevent that, but I think definitely there's a move to representative money because you reduce the ability for pirates to seize it. Because mm -hmm. uh, the one thing you can do with representative money is you can mark it. Um, if you put numbers on it that say, hey, I know what, you know what bills have been issued and where they were on a ship, then you know, hey, these bills were stolen and there's potential even to say, hey, these bills show up. We know that was potentially the pirate or someone connected to the pirate that took the the bills quick 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 tangent only because i just found this out like a week ago you know those those money counters yes did you know they have cameras in there and they take they take record of all the numbers in them yep i had no clue cash is tracked i was just like mind blown you know and i i, I know that's probably so obvious to anybody it's like well of course they're keeping track of the numbers but it's just it's so crazy how technology has advanced that it's like I mean, it's not that crazy. I mean, if you drive down a tollway, it's getting your license plate. But th those money counters go real quick. Yep. So anyway, anyway, sorry. I, I just thought that was fascinating. No, definitely. It, it's like there are early er origins of that. And I'm not sure where we eventually stood, you know, like counting or tracking money specifically with numbers. But I'm def I know that it became very common to the point where, like, in the 18th or 19th century, people did bank robberies. And sometimes people could figure out uh, where those bank robbers were by tracking that money. Or right. telling every bank, hey, if you see, see bills with this number, let us know that might be a bank robber. But, but you, you're saying they've been doing this since the very beginning? But that, uh, I would say since at least the 18th or 19th century. Okay. At some point they realized, hey, if we're issuing paper money, we can track it too. Okay. Not just for validity or, or provenance of the actual currency, but actually 
like make sure it's not duplicated or yeah. just keeping track of the the flow of where it went. Yeah, I, I think I think for both. I think uh, the first one for sure, and the second one eventually over time. Mm. Yeah, and and eventually, yeah, it started in China, spread to Europe, and it's basically been uh, commonplace ever since. So we we found ourselves. Uh, we found ourselves in this role where typically out of all those uh, currencies that were being issued, you could, you could call, you know, it is money, but it's also kind of a currency in the sense that a government controls it. There was usually a race to be the person, the, the, the country that had the most respected money. Essentially, if you were the most economically dominant, you're probably going to have the most reserves that you can, you know, basically lock up and then issue money against uh, or currency against. And so they would typically become the most powerful nation because people would trust their money the most and the threat of force if someone maybe started counterfeiting or otherwise um, acting against their interests. So mm. you typically would see this uh, kind of reserve currency rise to the top of all the other currencies, the best money, so to speak, um, over time. And so you would start out with, um, you know, you would have these, they would change place over time, weaker powers lose influence, kind of rise and fall of empires. So you have this timeline that you can look at over the last 500 years. You start with Portugal, because they found the spice trade to the new world, and so mm. they got very popular. And then Spain found the new world um, and actually started to trade uh, and get a lot of gold and silver out of the Americas. And then the Netherlands started to Netherlands. do a lot of piracy. Yeah, pi oh. yeah piracy. Where did they come from? Be... Well, there was some piracy. They took over parts of the new world. They took over parts of the spice trade from Portugal. Okay. Um, so Amsterdam actually pioneered a lot of banking techniques that became commonplace. Um, so like Antwerp was like a center of finance for a lot of, of Europe. And then eventually... Uh, France became uh, very dominant because of the military power of France and Napoleon and a lot of the Napoleonic Wars. And then eventually the UK, uh, dominant mm -hmm. navy, massive British empire, all the way up to uh, the 20th century when eventually the US dollar starts to take over as well. So with a reserve currency, it's typically just one, right? Typically just one in the sense that like most nations are always going to favor it one currency over all the others you know mm -hmm. naturally they have their own preferences but for people that do international trading you know there there's so many different currencies we could use or different forms of money right. let's stick with the one that seems the most common and usually that's the most dominant power at the time most and then it's, empire. And it, it's not like there's a world vote it's just a market driven type thing right? exactly yeah it, it's it's literally uh you know it's competition what's the best money who has the biggest market who has the best trade Mm -hmm. uh, and and who has the best banking sector in a lot of cases too, or financial sector in general. Well, you said something that reminded me of because uh, I used to work in the Middle East, and all through my twenties, I would always hear, "Better learn Mandarin, better learn Mandarin." <laughs> you know, China, China. You know, because they're going to take over. They're going to take over. And then when I live in the Middle East, like English is business language. Mm -hmm. So then I immediately was like. Oh, well, I mean, it, it's still nice to learn another language. I mean, I don't know Mandarin. <laughs> but, uh, but I was hit in the face with this concept of, you know, English being the, the, the language of choice for the business world. Yep. So it, in my head, it's kind of like, okay, well, you know, it, the reserve currency is, you know, the, the U.S. dollar right now. Well, the reserve currency of language in the business world is English at the moment. Yep. In, and obviously that can shift as different things happen in the global landscape. Yeah, but I, I think that's a good point to bring up because when you talk about like what are w w the language impact of the fact that English is so prevalent and, and necessary for business nowadays, in, in international business especially, you can also see like international languages still sometimes in French or in Spanish. Uh, mm -hmm. Like if you look at this list specifically, uh, and naturally this is because they were like colonial empires, so they naturally had a lot of influence over world affairs for right. a long time but that influence you kind of like see the height of that influence usually paired with the height of their currency or their their money because well, look at yeah. africa and how many countries still speak french yep absolutely yeah you know. and, and the same thing for spanish and latin america absolutely yeah so i mean these are countries that had a big impact and, and their monetary systems were very prevalent there but you notice that culture and language seems to have be much more lasting than money yeah money if it's not good anymore will typically fall very quickly from grace and be replaced with something better. Well, it's always interesting uh, to me when, when there is a, a fall for money, and I, and I, I know we're going to get back on talking, it, but because I remember there was a huge market uh, after the Iraq war for the, the Iraqi dinar. Yes. They're like, oh, it's going to come back, it's going to come back, so buy a billion of it now because <laughs> you'll make millions when it comes back. And I, to my knowledge, it didn't. Mm. <laughs> so that was just a wasted investment. 
Uh, unless you wanted to have expensive uh, paper that you can burn or something, or souvenirs. Yeah, there's plenty of those. But yeah, it's, it's definitely like a way you can definitely bet on the success of a country, but right. uh, there's obviously large risks there uh, right, that right, come right. with it. But yeah, and, and that's where we, we kind of find ourselves today is now the U.S. Uh, is ultimately in this position. Uh, and, and the question is, how did we get here, ultimately? What put us in the position to be the most, uh, the dominant power of the age, especially... Patriotism. In, in, patriotism, but probably also a lot of economic activity and yeah. the way the 20th century played out. So we started with, for example, prior to 1913, a lot of people might not know this, we didn't have a central bank or a federal reserve. We actually had a free money system. The U.S. government issued some money, uh, some greenbacks, like dollars, uh, but in a lot of cases, banks would issue their own uh, bank notes, for example. They would hold gold or silver in their vaults, and then they would issue some bank note, and you could use that as legal tender. Um, but it was kind of chaotic because, you know, anyone could issue paper. And mm -hmm. if that bank went under, then suddenly that paper is not worth anything because they, you know, did some lending practices that weren't very, uh, you know, let's say sustainable. And they would go potentially bankrupt and then suddenly those bills are worthless. And so tracking all that was kind of chaotic. So in, when we watch a Western TV show or Western movie and we see the guy, bank robbers rob a bank and then they go to a, another city... Potentially, those notes couldn't be converted over. Potentially, uh, it's I know that's a, a random. I, but I mean, I'm just thinking because I'm thinking. I, I had no idea that there was just anybody could issue currency, and it was like it. You know, I guess yep. it's backed by gold, maybe. Or, yeah, or, or whatever that. Or bank the promise of that bank. Exactly, and that's that was a, that I think had a big impact. Is people would either move that either the gold and silver, of course, which was like kind of the thing you would want, but also banknotes. And mm -hmm. but you know, if you could move faster than a, a postal service. Uh, you could potentially outrun that if you were able to spend it quickly. Huh. Um, so, and you know, I'm not an expert in how that all played out, but right. I know that in general there was just a very different system at play. And that's there was a uh, a panic in 1907, a market panic, and they happen recurringly as they usually do in most economies. But uh, this particular one was so bad that a lot of banks might go under. And one of the biggest banks at the time, J.P. Morgan, the literal J.P. Morgan. Um, uh, in flesh and blood had to bail out uh, a lot of the banking sector. Do you know what caused that in 1907? Uh, I believe it was something like a railroad investment collapse or something okay. similar to that. You know, some very similar to kind of 2008. There was just some speculation in some market that a lot of people um, defaulted on and then that hit the banking sector really hard. But, it, what, but that's not the, the start of the Great Depression because that no, was like no. in the 20s, right? Exactly, yeah. This was something that was minor by comparison, but Got it did it. have a big impact on banking. And the bankers at the time said, hey, you know, it would be nice to have someone other than a big rich guy like J.P. Morgan. Like, God forbid he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. What would have happened? So there was a lot of bankers saying, well, how would we protect ourselves if this happened again? Um, if we essentially default on our, our uh, promises, who's going to bail us out? And the Federal Reserve was ultimately the, the kind of entity that would be the lender of last resort and provide protection, at least in theory, to the rest of the economy to protect, mm -hmm. kind of act as a monetary steward for the, for the nation. So the Federal Reserve, in theory, is there to protect the country from stupidity and going under? Yes, or at the very least, the banking sector. The banking sector. In, in the sense of, instead of uh, a bank's, you know, so a bank would have their reserves, their gold and silver sitting in their vault, uh, and then another bank would have their reserves in their vault, and you kind of have to do cross-auditing to figure out who's right, who's wrong, mm -hmm. um, how are you going to pay each other, are you going to pay each other in their own currency? The Federal Reserve is the ultimate reserve. Because The reason I bring that up, because it seems like there's a lot of chatter of pro reserve pro yes. anti you know they're they're screwing everything up they're breaking this so it, it, do we know what their mandate is is it just to protect like the banks is that what it is originally that was effectively their mandate i think their mandate has definitely grown over time mm -hmm. in the way that they're they're engaging the political sphere but in the beginning it was basically just you're going to both regulate the private banking sector um, and you're going to provide a source of reserves, or specifically a place where every bank can put the reserves. So instead of, so it's the bank, it's the bank of banks. You know, when I want to send money to you from my Wells Fargo account uh, to your Bank America account, um, you know, that's just a one-to-one -one transaction between us. But what happens when Wells Fargo wants to send a transaction to Bank of America directly? Um, you know, like for example, our deposit account, someone just moves the digits between us and we're good. But for banks, who does that? That's the Federal Reserve. When Bank of America wants to send. $20, million, $20 billion to Wells Fargo, they do it not through another bank, but through the Federal Reserve. It is the Bank of Banks. And that's where, you know, now Bank of America doesn't have to trust that Wells Fargo has the money in their account. It's at the Federal Reserve. So it's, it's and in that situation, it's, it's, you're basically putting in a third party's hand to 
to validate that that's actually happening. Exactly. Okay. In, in a way, you can think the Federal Reserve is just there. Your to face put, right there was just such like, oh, maybe you're not an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it's something that I had to figure out because it's like it's not very clear what the Federal Reserve necessarily does. But when you dig into it, it's really this they're a, a bank for banks. And, mm -hmm. and but they can go further than that because they can also issue uh, the currency. So not only so in the same way that independent banks could issue their own currency. Now the Federal Reserve comes in and says, no, y'all don't issue currency. We issue currency. And that way everyone's on the same page. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it makes sense. But, you know, naturally, that also means that issuing money is a pre pretty powerful position to be in. The Federal right. Reserve has that power. And I should say, the U.S. kind of came to this conclusion because other countries like the U.K. and Germany at the time already had central banks, so we kind of felt like we're just catching up. Right. Um, and, and in the past, we'd had national banks um, that existed both uh, very early when the country was founded and then even around the time of Andrew Jackson. And there was always this political battle of, should anyone be allowed to issue currency or should only one bank be allowed to issue currency? And that's, it's an ongoing debate to the day. Well, well you know, not to bring up anything ridiculous, but that's my job. Uh, you know, like <laughs> Hamilton, you know, only because the ha musical Hamilton brought him into such uh, uh, light. I, th I think I read somewhere or saw on a podcast somewhere that if he would have lived, like the banking sector or the treasury or the reserve probably would have started a lot sooner potentially just yeah. because he, I, I, I and again i might just be making stuff up so nobody fact check me uh but because i think that's where a lot of his ideas were headed towards yes yeah he was very much about i want to centrally manage financial system because right. he believed that would be stronger and healthier for the country and some people like jefferson disagree and said no i think letting it be decentralized and letting people decide what bank they decide to trust is is a better system so mm -hmm. you had this back and forth of of, of who's right, and ultimately we, like right now, I guess the Hamiltons of the world are winning because Federal Reserve has been around for 100 years, but in a way the Bitcoiners of the world are a bit Jeffersonian. Mm -hmm. So and so for the Federal Reserve, uh, right after that we have World War One breaks out, um, and this was a war where all the big, you know, at that time London uh, in England was kind of the big financial capital, and, Ger and Germany and European countries had a lot of uh, financial capital built up, but suddenly they're at war and they've got to spend. Right. And so they start spending money, they, their reserves get depleted, and they need to start borrowing, and ultimately the U.S. is one of the largest economies not involved in the beginning, so we start to lend out. And usually, when you're doing international payments, you're not going to do one specific currency, uh, when it's between countries, you're going to do it in gold and silver, because that's the best thing to trust. So right. we ended up getting uh, a lot of either promises for payment in gold and silver, or gold and silver itself. And so I because of this... I, I don't know. Yeah. World War One taking promises of gold and silver... <laughs> Beca I mean, because what if that country goes under? Well, yeah, it's ultimately you're betting on who's going to win. I guess that, yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. play. And that's ultimately what the U.S. did uh, yeah. and why we, there's rumors that the one of, probably one of many reasons we eventually joined that war is because we wanted to make sure that the people owing us money were the ones that win. And, those, yeah, and those countries ended up going I, to the, the losers saying, hey, you owe us money for losing, which was probably to pay us off. Maybe, I don't know. Which, ultimately, Treaty of Versailles probably pushed, made uh, World War II. Potentially. I've never heard that. Yeah. I've, I'm, I'm pretty good on history, and I've never heard that uh, uh, potentially the reason the U.S. joined the um, World War One was to secure our investment. Yep. That's a very strong it possibility. Sounds valid. Yeah. Well, what's crazy to me is, like, everybody, well, not everybody, but most people know World War One started because of... Uh, Oh, shit, I forget his name. Oh, uh, uh, Gavrilo Princip shooting the Archduke of uh, Ar Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary. Austria for, for, uh, Ferdinand. Is that his for, name? Yeah, Ferdinand. Yeah, but what most people... Oh, he was assassinated, but what most people don't realize is that the Allies were on the side of the assassinators. We weren't on the side of the guy that got killed. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, was, I, I saw that and I was like, wait a minute, so we're, we're back in the... Like team assassins. Well, and it was a very like I know it's yeah. it's it, that's convoluted and it goes way 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 more into it, but it was just a, a game of dominoes. Just yeah, well, it was just like it was a radical group that they were kind of sponsored by this one country. Yeah. That country, the was Black Hand, I think it was. Yeah, exactly. And so yeah, it was just this domino effect. But um, yeah, we un ultimately like you know kind of chose a financial side in that war. At least yeah. a lot of bankers and, and financiers. Can you see US. we're consistent? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and then. 
And, and then from there, because we were ultimately demanding these debts, uh, like the UK ended up abandoning their gold standard. They said, you know, oh. our currency is no longer worth a certain amount of gold because we just don't feel like we can pay it off. We had to do so much spending and print so much money. Right. And a lot of people look to the U.S. now instead of the pound uh, as ultimately a, a currency that is that is backed enough by commodity to be trustworthy. Now this. It didn't happen overnight, you know. I think over time, yeah. the the pound got replaced by the dollar. But this is kind of where it kind of officially started to. to but but to going back to that, that the the slides of the reserves, that makes perfect sense. Of oh, you're no longer backed by the gold. Well, U.S. still is. So immediate. Well, obviously, it's not immediate. But then there's a shift. Yep. U.S. You're still backed by the uh, gold. So you're going to be the reserve choice uh, of the the global. Economy exactly yeah in a lot of countries over that time you had the the Great Depression hit many other countries were forced to abandon their gold standard because they had to do government spending to, to keep up mm. or they had to pay off debts that they just couldn't meet so uh, like over this this period of time many countries start to abandon the gold standard except for the U.S. and even in the U.S. Uh, FDR had this very dramatic moment where he in 1933 made it illegal to have private gold. He said, okay, if you've got gold, uh, you know, there was a standard rate of $20 per uh, ounce of gold. You gotta turn in your gold, you'll get your $20, so we're not stealing from you, you know, kind of. Um, but at that, once that had been done, uh, they rebalanced the, uh, the, the peg, so now it was $35 uh, per ounce of gold. So maybe you still have dollars for it, but the value of, it in, of dollars in gold is now depreciated considerably. I wonder if they actually seized people's property they um or like if, oh yeah. you're hoarding gold like if you like hit it in the walls or something if they came and knocked on your doors and st and oh here they took it but here's your 20 dollars so as it would be something to dig into because i haven't read into like yeah. maybe any specific incidents that occurred but i, think I never i never be, knew that i didn't like, know they seized it most businesses i imagine were, were going to be forced to comply and maybe right. individuals could get away with it it's kind of one of those things of like it's a law in the books but how much is it going to get enforced probably right, right. But it was definitely a threat of force yeah. that existed. And so that's a, an interesting reason for why a lot of gold ended up circling, circulating up to the government and sitting in the vaults um, at that time and, and put the government in a position to dictate that price. We always hear Fort Knox is like, oh, so much gold, so much gold, so much gold. And it's like, oh, well, that's why. Because they literally got all the gold <laughs> of the entire country in one, one swoop. It's one of the reasons, yeah. I, I forget, I don't know how much they had prior, but it, defi it definitely increased the numbers, for sure. I have never knew I never knew that. Yeah. And then after that, we have World War II. And so, same deal. We start selling arms to the Allies for gold. Uh, UK, France, we're funding them. Huh. We're sending over ships with arms, they're sending over ships with gold. Um, there was actually one point where the UK sent all their gold reserves from the UK to Canada, just in case uh, anything went poorly and they could still finance the war. Really? So uh, definitely who, how you hold gold and where it was was a big factor. But ultimately, because we were in a position in the beginning to uh, you know, finance a lot of people and send over arms, we still had a great uh, financial, or I'm sorry, industrial sector to build the arms necessary and get paid. Uh, a lot of those payments were in gold, and so our cash of gold just grew from there. It, it makes incredible sense once you actually think about it. But like, I think, because I've always, you know, you study history, yeah, um, we sell a um, hundred planes to the British for a dollar or, you know, you hear stuff like that, but you don't really think of, oh, the reason the United States has so much gold is because World War One, World War Two, and all these countries bought so much stuff from the U.S., but they paid for it in gold. Yep. You know, because again, 2021, we're thinking, oh, let me just sell you some money. Yeah. You know, let me just send you this cash app or send you some Bitcoin or send you, you know, here's my credit card. You know, but obviously, you know, World War One, World War Two, it's like, yeah, here's all my gold. Yep. Yeah, and when it's a war, it's like, you know, that's because, you know, that country is probably depreciating their money. So you're like, I don't want your money. Like, you could very well be printing that to oblivion just to keep going for another year. I'm going to want gold. Right. So that's that's a big factor for it. And so ultimately, in 1944, this this situation where the dollar is just becoming the, you know, we're, we as a country are going to hold all this gold. Many other countries just don't have the gold to back their own currencies. Uh, there's this kind of recognition that, hey, you know, if the U.S. has these many, th all this gold and dollars are becoming so prolific, why don't we just hold dollars on our balance sheet as a country and then say our currency is backed by the dollar and the dollar is backed by gold and that's almost as good as gold. Hmm. And that's where the dollar really became the official, kind of an official sense, the reserve currency for the rest of the world. 
and uh, and and ever since, you know, or at least for the next several decades, that was kind of the the status quo. So Bretton Woods was that kind of like a a world congress type thing kind of it was a financial congress in new hampshire at Bretton woods new hampshire everyone most of the uh, representatives of the large countries got together several famous economists like uh, maynard keynes were there and they basically mm. decided you know this is where we're at i think this is pretty much the way we should organize things going forward and so you know yeah in a sense it was kind of a a, a world recognition of this but it was kind of a quiet conference it wasn't like a something like the u.n meeting or anything like that it was mm -hmm. just kind of the the financial uh, ministers or at least financial representatives meeting and saying, may not even made the newspaper. Yeah, it was. Just it's kind very of a, like super secret, like elites yeah. deciding what's going to happen. And, for the and world. I would say less secret and just more like there's no fanfare. It's just kind of like you know, yeah. it's a bunch of accountants almost getting together. But accountants for very large countries. Hey, accountants are sexy. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of well, know. in this <laughs> case, uh, they definitely made a very big splash. And at this point, yeah. from then on forward, the dollar was effectively the world reserve currency. Okay. So where do we go from there? Yeah. Well, we moved to fiat money eventually, or you hear this term fiat money. You know, I've never heard the term fiat as much as in the past three months because of friends being anti-fiat, pro-Bitcoin, <laughs> da-da-da-da. But, you know, obviously it makes sense when you know what it is, but you just, because again, it goes back to what we were talking about before about the, two, the four purposes of money. It's like, what do I care? I need to buy a, I need to buy a, a, a loaf of bread or something, mm -hmm. you know, so you don't need to use the word fiat. Yeah, you know, as a as a normal person. Yeah, as a normal person, you would you wouldn't consider it. But when you're looking at it from a historical perspective, and definitely from a I guess a Bitcoin perspective, you look at fiat as something that isn't really backed by a promise beyond the government. It's kind of like it's, the government's the only thing backing it. There's no gold and silver. So how did how did the U.S. get to that point? Because we had so much gold. Yeah. Well, we had a lot of spending. We had our own wars to fight. We had Vietnam. We had Johnson's Great Society. We had large debts that we were we were issuing and and paying in dollars and, and printing dollars to pay for. So. Eventually, there was a recognition in the 60s by a lot of the countries, including France, that, hey, these dollars that we're holding to back our own currencies might not be worth the same amount in gold that they used to be. And so there was, a, there was kind of almost a run on the banks. There was a, a bunch of countries coming to the U.S. saying, hey, I want my gold for these dollars because it's redeemable for gold. Uh, so they started redeeming it for gold. And there was this large outflow of gold from the U.S. to the point uh, where over time, Nixon in 1971 suspended the convertibility of dollars into gold. And that was the point where we went from dollars are good as gold, or at least a promise for gold, to dollars being just a promise by the government that it should be worth something. This hmm. was the switch. It was, a, um, it was a move that was kind of temporary. It was uh, part of a new economic policy and temporary suspension, but it's a suspension that's been held up. Well, it's interesting, though, because if, if I remember our, the slide about the... Uh, um, you know, the, the, the reserves, where it went from here to here to Netherlands to France to the UK to America or United States. It's like, it's almost like we, in true American form, we're like, yeah, we still want to remain in the reserve, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna change the rules on everybody. Pretty much. You know, that's what it sounds like. And it's like, hey, we still want to be the reserve, so yeah, we're changing the rules. Yeah, changing the rules. And at that point, like, what's the alternative? You know, you had maybe yeah. the Soviets, but who is, no one's going to trust them with, with the gold standard either, either. And we still had a larger economy. So Right. But to our credit, though, it's like it seems like, again, not to repeat myself, but all those people, all, not people, those countries, like the reason the U.K. and went from U.K. to United States is because of World War One. And then, you know, we still got more gold from World War II. And then when we had our wars and we almost lost the reserve, again, changed the game. Yep. So, you know, props to America. <laughs> yeah. And, and we basically not only made that decision for us, but we basically decided not only are we going to be fiat, but everyone's going to be fiat. Because they hold dollars with right. the expectation that it's gold. But guess what? You're now backed by fiat and not gold. Right. Uh, because they kind of saw it as a proxy for gold. So it was... It was America changing its policy, but changing kind of the monetary policy for everyone at the same time, which kind of represents the power that we, we had and kind of still do mm -hmm. in, in uh, the world economy. Hmm. So uh, ever since, that's basically been the policy. And so we've kind of, we, I guess that's kind of where this segment ends, but ultimately, yeah. where do we go from here? We now have fiat money. It's not backed by anything but a government, and we're in a world where the governments can decide how much they print. Well, it, it, it's, it's interesting, though, because, like, I know this is probably a little bit longer than we thought it would be, but it's like you start at goats and wheat, and then you go all the way to, to the gold standard, and then we end on 
eh, we're going to make our own rules. Yeah. And I love, I, for, I don't know why they, I mean, I love it. I know it, it's probably, I probably shouldn't be enjoyed. It's probably like, hey, that's probably not the way it should have been done, but I, I don't know, go America. <laughs> well, and, and from here it's like, okay, well, what rules are going to replace it? And that's, that's where Bitcoin comes in. Because yeah. people said, you know, we need something. We need something that does instill some rules beyond just what a government decides in an election cycle or a central banker decides makes sense at the time because those are short-term decisions. What's mm -hmm. going to be the long-term uh, process for determining value? Because now a government determines value in a very ad hoc basis. So what's going to be money that we can trust with value over time? So you teach this at university. What are what are some typical questions you would get after this instruction? Like, I, I've, I think I've asked questions, but what are usual questions from students that usually get during this segment? I would say one of the bigger questions that they had is like, what's the, um, how does the world economy work now with with the dollar? Like, what's been this new segment, and why like, why are we trusting each other? And it's kind of like we're we're all currencies. The demand for dollars is usually paying taxes, buying American goods, mm -hmm. all these other things. So we've kind of maintained some value over time, but um, we've also kind of tied everyone to us. So we're kind of all. Uh, tied to the same fate at the time, or at least all the large countries that trade with the U.S. and part of the larger Western world, uh, even countries like China are in a sense tied to us with our trade. Um, but there is this expectation, there's this kind of growing realization that the U.S. is kind of abusing that position because mm -hmm. there's now no checks on our ability to print money. Um, so what, well, what would replace this? Because what other country would you trust? Would you trust China? Most people won't. Right. We, all, we all hear China is going to become the new world reserve currency. That's probably not going to happen because not a lot of people really trust China right. outside of China. So, but, but what would you trust as a country outside of gold or, or something else? Right. And it, it seems a little arcane. Is that right? right? Anyway, yeah. to go back to like, hey, let's, let's put our, let's, let's lock it down to some sort of element. Yeah. You know, I mean, that just seems... a almost absurd nowadays so like having like a crypto like a bitcoin almost sounds more tangible and real than hey let's go back to gold or let's use copper or whatever yep you know so yeah that's where we're going from here what's going to be the new yeah and, and another thing what's what's fascinating to me as well is the word trillion i my entire life i've never heard trillion used as much as like this past year yeah because let's just face it trillion is a lot there's no reason we should be using the word trillion unless we're talking about oh that planet is a trillion miles or a trillion light years away or something yeah but now it's if you turn on the news right now it's every day that oh, this this uh, new build back whatever uh, this new plan this new budget this it, it trillion this trillion that and you're just like that's insane to me it's crazy yep well you need trillion a couple decades ago, but now when currencies change in value over time, and especially when they're uh, they're not constrained by any specific rule, mm -hmm. um, that'll happen. And that's kind of the that's where we're at. You know, countries are not very disciplined in spending, especially in the short term, especially right. not democracies when you can vote for something. So ultimately, we're going down a, a road where we're going to have to decide how do we determine value in a world where that can change based on an election cycle. So out of everything that we just discussed, like what is what do you think is the biggest takeaway that people should, I mean, obviously the history of it, there, it's, it's kind of hard to put, <laughs> break it down to one thing, but like what's, what's the biggest thing that you think people should walk away with? I think really just quite being able to realize that money is not a static thing, or at the very least, what you use for money on a day-to-day -day basis could change. And we used to live in a world where there were different forms of money all the time, and I think we as Americans are kind of able to take that for granted because mm -hmm. the dollar's still a very high standard for money compared to other countries right. but will it be forever and it, it, I don't think the dollar is going to ever go away but I think there could definitely be a world in which the dollar is not nearly as prominent and we're going to have to look at other forms of money to protect ourselves or or to engage in commerce with other people that might not trust it I actually just saw Lee president of blockchain uh, Texas blockchain council he actually was uh, uh, on Twitter commenting on on a big brand Saying, hey, respectfully, because uh, the, the tweet was somebody putting Bitcoin at odds with the U.S. dollar. Mm. And, and Lee's point was, respectfully, we should never go against, we should work in tandem. Yes. You know, so it was very, 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 you know, 
political and, and, and nice. Politically <laughs> correct is the right way to go. Yeah, about. But, but that's, I mean, you know, we never considered gold to be a threat to the dollar necessarily, uh, at least for the most part. So in many ways, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are similar. They're an yeah. alternative. They're not necessarily a one or the other. Right. And that's, that's the difference, I think, is um, ultimately you're going, living in a multi-currency world is actually normal for most people. Like if you live in a country like, um, you know, uh, anywhere in Latin America or most other, like, Countries outside the U.S., they, they will use dollars and right. they'll use their local currency and maybe even others that they, they trade with. Well, it's almost like language as well. Like, yes. Because if you look at Europe, they probably have in their wallet three or four different currencies and they also probably speak three or four different languages. <laughs> well, actually, luckily, they have a, a, a oh, euro oh, yeah, that yeah. they get to deal with. Europe but is the wrong, wrong example. But, 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 but yeah, I think that's, it's an important point of like, the, yeah. like money is kind of an extension of, of a country's uh, presence right. or their culture or their history. And so in many ways, that's also going to become mixed around. So what's the, you know, the dollar represents the America, but ultimately for the rest of the world, they want something that is more representative of everyone. Right. So what would that be? It probably won't be based on a specific country any longer. It might be based on something that is, we can agree on, like maybe something mathematic, maybe something in computer science, maybe something like a technology. Mm -hmm. So as far as the future uh, of, not the future, but the, the, the continuing aspects of this course and this series, what can the viewers uh, look forward to if they continue watching these? I would say they're going to look forward to a lot more explanations of what the alternatives are uh, to the dollar. So basically diving into Bitcoin, diving into blockchain, diving into crypto. You know, now you know why you might want crypto or blockchain, why it might be better than the existing dollar system, or at least a good alternative in mm -hmm. some c circumstances. Uh, now we're going to learn, like, what is that? Why is it a better alternative? Excellent. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, if you want to follow me, uh, I'm at Ryan S. Harper on Twitter, Instagram, pretty much everywhere. Uh, hopefully, I've, I've played a good advocate for the layman. Michael, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me at, at Llewellyn Michael uh, on Twitter, or they can find me on LinkedIn by the same name. Uh, and uh, I'm always around looking to ask and answer questions. And if you have any questions, drop them in the comments below. And uh, thanks for being here.